our Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to us. And Lord Jesus, you came to us not just to show us an example of how we are to live, though truly you are the quintessential example of how we are to live. You didn't come to us just to, to show us how to be more spiritual. But Lord, you came to us to save us from our sin. And it cost you everything. Lord, you did pay it all. And you finished the work that you came to finish. And Lord, we stand amazed that you would lay down your life for sinners like us. We thank you for the salvation that we have through you. And Lord, as we look at your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. And Lord, I pray that we would be responsive to you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's good to see you tonight. I'm glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to ask you to pray about something. I haven't done this before. Well, just a brief, also, I need to say this. I found out, my wife told me, Annette, you're the teacher of the year. And so she won that award. So that's a praise God. That, that someone from our church, that's a, that's a blessing. And so we rejoice with you. Um, and we're thankful for you. I, I did want to ask you all to pray. There's been a recurring theme. If you've prayer walked our community and if you're just listening and watching, the Lord keeps raising up and showing us Spanish speakers who were literally asking us, do you have a Spanish-speaking service or a Spanish-speaking Bible study class? And tonight, uh, or today rather, during the Spring Fest, apparently we had some individuals from the community here asking, do you have a Spanish-speaking class or service? So can I just ask you all, I'm going to ask the Sunday group as well, would you join me in praying? Because I think that God is saying something to us. Because in addition to what's happening on the outside within our own church, we've had people who have said, Pastor, if you ever do something with this, that, or the other, or if the church ever decides to do something for Spanish speakers, let me know. So let's pray about that. Can, can we join in prayer together for that? Okay, good. All right. Uh, well, please do that. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the Gospel of Mark. We are in uh, our sermon series Jesus through their eyes. Statements on the front end. Bad theology leads to a wrong view of God. And everybody is doing theology. Theology simply means a study of God. A wrong view of God leads to misconceptions about God and mischaracterizations of God, which then lead to misguided expectations of God, and those things will lead us to false worship, to false hope, and inevitably to disappointment and to cynicism. Misguided expectations of God also will cause us to miss what God is actually doing because we're so focused on what we want him to be about, what we want him to do, we end up missing his purpose is in what he's actually doing. I hope that makes sense. These are dangers for every people and every time and every culture throughout history. It's certainly a danger to us today. And it was a danger to the people of Jesus' day. And we're going to see this play out in our sermon text today. In this sermon series, Jesus Through Their Eyes, we have been looking at Jesus through the eyes of people who knew him people who had meaningful interactions with him. And so far to this point, we have been looking at Jesus through the eyes of individuals, meaning individual people and how Jesus interacted with them and how they saw him. But today, it's not Palm Sunday, but it's a Palm Sunday message. Palm Sunday's tomorrow. But for Palm Sunday, we take a different approach. We're going to look at Jesus, not through the eyes of an individual, rather through the eyes of the crowd, the crowd, a crowd that is enthusiastically saying all the right things, but for all the wrong reasons. We're going to see a crowd that has imposed their own 
personal desires, hopes, and dreams, and expectations on Jesus, for Jesus, for his mission, for his kingdom. And in doing so, they completely miss Jesus and the real reason that he came, the real kingdom that he was about. A little background before we get into our text. You can turn to Mark 11 if you'd like. Jesus' earthly ministry is entering its final week. He's just raised Lazarus from the dead, and news of this has now gone out to the masses. The story has gotten out everywhere, and people are unbelievably excited. And many are thinking he has to be Messiah. He teaches with uncommon authority. He performs miracles. He heals the sick, and now he's raising the dead. There's no one like him. He has to be, but when they are thinking about Messiah, <clears throat> they're thinking of Messiah in a different way than you and I do on the other side of the cross and resurrection. You see, they're thinking of Messiah in terms of the political Messiah, the military deliverer who will remove Rome, restore the glory of Israel, establish an earthly kingdom with Jerusalem as the center where he will rule the nation. So they see Messiah as this military political deliverer. They had this faulty understanding of Messiah. Now make no mistake, Jesus is returning and the scripture is clear. He will reign in a new heaven and a new earth and the nations will bow before him. But in his first appearing, he appears to us not as the conquering king, but as the suffering servant who came to die for our sins to address our greatest need, our greatest problem, to take away our sins and to reconcile us to the Father. He didn't come to establish a physical earthly kingdom. The crowd doesn't understand that. They don't understand that Jesus is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So on that Palm Sunday, the crowd is shouting the praises of Jesus. And sadly, towards the end of the week, many of that same crowd will then be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, because Jesus did not meet their misguided expectations. But today, they're shouting his praises because they think he's the Messiah they want him to be. Mark 11, 1 and following. We'll break the text into segments and take a look at key ideas. <clears throat> now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage, and to Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said and they let him go. And they bought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. So in this section, what you're going to notice some key things. Jesus gave very specific instructions. And these instructions are very intentional because they fulfill, if you're a note taker, Zechariah 9.9, they fulfill prophecy. Jesus is going to intentionally fulfill prophecy. And in doing what he's doing, entering this way, he is sending a message to everyone. I am the one. I am the king that the Messiah that Zechariah prophesied about when he said in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And isn't it amazing how Jesus, when we talk about his triumphal entry, doesn't enter Jerusalem on a war horse with great pomp and circumstance, saying, look at me, I'm him with that 
kind of a mentality, but rather he rides in lowly, humbly. The crowds are going to sing his praises, and they're going to say very true things, but they're completely missing why he's come. Look at the reaction of the crowds in verses 8 and following. And it's kind of difficult for us as 21st century Westerners to appreciate and to understand what's happening here because we think, why are they doing that? Or why, why are they doing why, well, I, don't, I don't get what that means. And so we'll try to explain that so we can see what's happening here. It is very significant. Many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches they had cut off from the fields and Those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So here you see, as the crowds are watching Jesus, they're demonstrating their desire and their belief that Jesus is king by the way that they're receiving him. And to understand what they're doing by spreading their clothes out like that, this was something that you would do in those ancient cultures to welcome a new king. This is something you would do in the ancient world to welcome the king, to give him great honor. And they're saying by doing this, you are king. And we know from the other gospels, these leafy branches were palm branches. And those palm branches symbolize two very important things, joy and salvation. They were also a sign, a third thing, of Jewish nationalism. So what's happening here is that they're saying by these acts, great joy, our salvation is here, our king is here. He'll restore our greatness as God's people. He'll remove our shame and give us honor. That's their hope, and that's their belief. That's what they want Jesus to do. But Jesus is coming to give a much greater joy, a joy that he and he alone can give us by bringing us into relationship with our Father. And he comes to give us a much greater salvation than political salvation. Oh, he comes to save our souls, to undo the curse that has plagued us since our first parents rebelled in the garden and sin entered into our human condition and led all of us to be born with a sinful nature. Jesus comes to save us from the power of Satan's sin and death. That's why he comes. The crowd does not understand this. But I pray that you do. I pray if you've not yet responded to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you will. That you'll understand And not impose misguided beliefs and expectations on him. But understand this is who you are and this is why you came. Because I'm a sinner who needs to be saved. Look what they're crying out. They're crying out, Hosanna. Now what does that mean? It means save now. It's so tragically ironic what they're saying and how they're missing at the same time. Because what they're saying is true. Save now. They desperately want salvation. But again, the salvation they're thinking of It's political and military. They don't understand their greatest need, their deepest need. Do you understand that your greatest need is to be saved? And Jesus is the only one who does that. And if you do, do you still praise him? Do you still rejoice? Do you still declare his glory for all that he's done for you? They're also shouting, blessed is he who comes the name of the Lord. Jesus has come from and he has come in the name of the Lord. He is God the Son in the flesh, sent by God the Father. He has come to do the Father's will. Jesus is God's gift to us. He is God's answer to our sin problem. They're also crying out, blessed is the coming of our father, David. And this is stunning Again, for them to be saying all that is right and at the same time to miss Jesus is also sobering because we can fall into that same error ourselves. 
This is a very clear statement that they were saying, we believe you are Messiah who has come from the line of David just as God promised. You see, God has kept his covenant with David. One has come, Jesus Christ, from the line of David that will reign forever and ever and ever. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. God has kept and is keeping his redemptive promise to his people. So as they say these things, it sure does seem like they get it, doesn't it? They're saying all the right stuff. But again, the salvation they want is political. The king they want is a military king. A misguided view of Jesus leads to misguided expectations. And how does this happen with us? Because often we think, I'll give you one of many examples we could use, we think that our greatest problems can be solved by politicians, by science, by medicine, by better economic programs, by our military. And please know that all of these are good things. But they can't solve our greatest needs. Jesus Christ and Christ alone does that. So when we look to any other thing or group or, or whomever that may be other than Christ to be that which only Christ can be and do, we're making a grave error. And we'll be just like the crowds. None of these things address our greatest problem. We are all sinners estranged from our creator, incapable of saving ourselves, incapable of fixing this relational issue we have with the holy God who cannot fellowship with sin. We are incapable of removing the sin stain from our own souls. We need a savior and Jesus Christ is that savior. He is the only one who can save. Jesus is the king who has come to lay down his life for his rebellious subjects and he has saved a wretch like me and he is in the business of still saving. So we must praise him and come to him as he has come to us, as he has presented himself to us as Lord and savior and to trust him. And to read the word of God and see how Jesus has revealed himself to us and to respond to Jesus, not as we want him to, but as he has called us to and commanded us to. Jesus came on the ultimate rescue mission to pay the penalty for your sins and mine, for the sins of the crowd. And as Jesus is riding through Jerusalem, the crowd is going wild but the only one who knows what's really going on is Jesus. The crowd's missing. They're missing the point. And were we to have time, I would look at the religious leaders, and you see they're not only missing the point, they're already plotting. They're already plotting. We have to get rid of this man. If we don't, we'll lose our place, and then Rome will come down on us. And the sad tragedy about all of this was their greatest fear, what they tried to get away from by killing Jesus actually comes about in AD 70 when Rome lays siege to Jerusalem. Well, they lost their place and they lost their power and it was horrific. Everybody is missing Jesus and that includes his own disciples. Only Jesus knows what's really happening you see, his own disciples have misguided expectations as well. You know, on the way up to Jerusalem, they were arguing over who was going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Can you imagine if you're Jesus and you know why you have come and to hear these men whom you have lived with and you have walked with for three and a half years arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus, I forgot who it was I recently heard. It's a very good point. Jesus would show them the answer to that about what true greatness was in that upper room when he took the servant's towel and he washed their feet. What I've done for you, you to do for one another. 
when his own disciples misunderstood Jesus, even though Jesus told them, I will be betrayed, arrested, and crucified, and I'll rise from the dead. Their eyes were blinded. Their hearts were dull. And their minds couldn't process because they were so focused on their own misguided expectations. And that's our danger. We start thinking, Jesus, you must be about my business. Do you see how we can do that? This is what I think you should be doing. Well, he's the king. We're not. And soon even the disciples, all the crowds we talked about that are yelling his praises and shouting his praises, many of them will soon be yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Soon these very disciples who were taking all of this in on that triumphal entry, and no doubt they're just amazed and in awe, well, soon they're going to abandon Jesus. One will betray him. One of his closest friends will deny having ever known him. Oh, yeah, the sad reality here is that everyone present is missing Jesus while singing and declaring his praises. Let's finish our text in verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The walk into the temple is really significant. Only Mark mentions this in his gospel. He's the only one to, to mention it. So what is happening here? Jesus is looking around in the temple. He is inspecting his father's house. As the son, he has the authority to inspect the father's house. He's taking it all in. And he's going to go into the temple one more time on Monday to cleanse it, to drive out the money changers, condemning them for profiteering off the worshiping community and turning his father's house into a place for profit. But also from that vantage point while he's in the temple, he can also look out and see where much of the war is going to take place this week. The events that are going to happen. What he's going to do. And it's getting late. There's not much else he can do at this hour. So he takes a 12 and leaves town. And he goes to Bethany, which is just two miles away. And that's where he stayed each night during Holy Week. Brady Wolcott wrote this about Jesus in Bethany in his commentary when it comes to Bethany and Holy Week. He said this, Each day, Jesus would come back to Jerusalem. On Monday, he would curse a fig tree and cleanse the temple. On Tuesday, he would challenge the Pharisees about false religion. But Jesus started his days and ended his days not in Jerusalem, but in Bethany, a small town just down the road from Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus spent every night of Holy Week in Bethany, except, of course, Friday and Saturday night when he was in the tomb. Bethany was the home of Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and Simon. Bethany was Jesus' refuge. It was the one place on earth where he was always accepted and never rejected. Jesus was anointed by Mary in Bethany on the Saturday before Palm Sunday. Mary sat at his feet in Bethany. He raised Lazarus in Bethany. He comforted and wept with Mary and Martha in Bethany. He healed Simon the leper in Bethany. Jesus loved Bethany because his spiritual family lived in Bethany when most all of his biological family had rejected him. This spiritual family had received them into their lives and home. They were his patrons, yes, but they were also his very precious friends. And in the middle of the hardest week of Jesus's earthly life, he retreated every day to Bethany. And when I see that, the humanity of Christ stands out. 
fully God, fully human. But where does he go every night to those people that love him dearly? Well, we have a sympathetic high priest who understands everything we've gone through and everything we experience. Walcott went on to say, when Mary anointed Jesus before Palm Sunday, she showed that she may have been the one person who understood what Jesus was doing, that he was going to die. Martha and Lazarus probably understood too, but the crowds, the Pharisees, and even Jesus' own disciples had no idea what was truly happening. And in many ways, that's the story of Palm Sunday. The crowds, for all the things they said, for all the things they did, completely missed Jesus because they were blinded by who they wanted Jesus to be. They were not listening to what he said about himself. Jesus Christ, God the Son, came to us, took on flesh, dwelt among us, again, fully God, fully human, perfectly obeying the Father. For this express purpose to lay down his life for you and for me, to take the punishment for our sins so that we could be forgiven. That's why he came. He didn't come to make us wealthier, stronger, more prosperous, healthier. He came to redeem us. Do you know the Redeemer? Don't miss him by imposing your misguided expectations on him. Come to him as he is, as he has revealed himself. So how do you need to respond to Christ tonight? If you were here, if you have any questions about where you stand with Christ, I'll be standing here in the front and you can come up in the, for, in the front and just say, look, I would like, I really want to make sure I'm clear on this. And let's set a time to meet. Or perhaps you want to plant yourself here and join with the church. You can come forward and do that as well. Or maybe you've never followed through in believer's baptism. That's our first act of obedience. And we're talking about Jesus as Savior, but also as Lord. And if he is our Lord, we want to be obedient to him. If you need to nail that down, please come forward. Or perhaps you just need to pray right where you are and just say, Lord, thank you for coming. And Lord, help me to see you as you are and to not impose my own misguided expectations on you so that I can worship you in spirit and in truth. If you have questions about any of these things and you're watching us on YouTube or live stream, please send an email at info at stonebridgesa.com and we will set a time to meet. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, it's so easy for us to look back on this side of the resurrection and just to wonder how could everybody miss it and how could everybody just not see it so plain and so clear to us. But Lord, we do a lot of this in our own way, in our own days. We, we have misguided expectations and we impose what we want you to do and all kinds of things like that. We're no different. Lord, I pray that we would be responsive to you as you have revealed yourself to us. I pray that we would be all about following you, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, and Lord, just following you, abiding in you, taking your yoke upon us and learning from you, walking with you. Lord, I thank you that you came to save people like me. And I pray that tonight we'd respond to you as we need to. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.